to this celebration of Osti's 75th anniversary. We're so happy uh, that you've come to join us. I'm the Osti director, and on behalf of my Osti colleagues, it's our pleasure to have you with us uh, for this commemoration of our own Diamond Jubilee. Uh, some of you are coming to us by a YouTube <coughs> live stream link, and um, others are coming to us through Zoom. And so however and wherever you may be joining us from, we really appreciate you being here and uh, look forward to the program and the speakers that we're gonna be presenting to you here shortly. And before we get into, uh, into those speakers and how much they mean to OSTE, both organizationally and individually, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the philosophy behind the program. And it's really the same philosophy uh, that has been uh, true for Austi's history over our entire existence, our 75-year history, and that it's somewhat twofold. Uh, one is that we have to have a dedicated and, and customer-focused workforce, which we definitely do. And the second uh, leg of that, uh, of that philosophy is that we have to have lasting, deep partnerships and, and relationships and friendships with the customers, the stakeholders, uh, and all the communities that are essential to our mission success. So let me talk a little bit about those relationships. Uh, first, that starts within the Department of Energy, of course, because our mission is to collect, preserve, and disseminate all of the R&D information that comes out of DOE's multi-billion dollar annual R&D investment. Uh, and uh, a bulk of that information comes from DOE's Office of Science, which is OSTE's parent organization, for the past uh, 20 plus years. So we, we came into uh, SC in the mid-1990s. In a 2020 reorganization, we became part of the Office of the Deputy Director for Field for Science Programs, excuse me. And that office is led by Dr. Harriet Kahn. And it has, it has been my pleasure, uh, pleasure and uh, honor to work with and for Harriet uh, as she has championed OSTI's integration with the six associate director research programs in the Office of Science, their division directors, their, their science uh, program managers, and all their science. And we it's a big priority for us to meet their needs and understand their needs and produce services that are meaningful to them. Um, and then beyond the Office of Science, of course, we are collecting information from all of the R&D programs in DOE, not just SC, the Office of Science, but re big research programs, and pardon the acronyms and the initials, but that includes organizations like uh, the National Nuclear in uh, Security Administration, NNSA, EERE in the area of energy efficiency and renewable energy, FE, uh, CM, uh, RPE. Uh, uh, for those not in DOE, these may not mean a lot to you, but uh, they're major research programs. And we have to have good relations with them to collect and disseminate their information. And those relationships really extend from all of the people in headquarters to all of the side offices for these organizations. And ultimately uh, the grantees and the laboratories that re receive this research funding, and there are 17 national DOE laboratories. And the people on the ground there at those laboratories are the scientific and technical information managers that really make it work for OSTE to be able to retrieve information from those labs. We have that perspective reflected in our program today. So we thank uh, the uh, leadership uh, for all of all of DOE, and we appreciate uh, uh, the partnerships that we have with them. Now, let me move it beyond DOE to include uh, other, other federal agencies. Um, there are counterpart type organizations to OSTE pretty much in every US federal science agency. Uh, the biggest and the benchmark of those, of course, is on our program today, and that's the National Library of Medicine with the National Institutes of Health. Uh, and the others include the Defense Technical Information Center at DOD, the uh, National Agricultural Library, the National Transportation Lab Library, uh, the Defense Technical Information Center, as I mentioned, uh, the NASA STI program. And one of our uh, deepest and most uh, significant relationships is with the National Science Foundation as we partner together to achieve public access requirements uh, together. And, and I would like to call out some of our dear friends there that, that work with us on that program. Uh, Martin Halbert, Alan Tompkins, 
uh, Amy Freelander before she retired. So we really appreciate all of the folks at NSF. And again, we work with these organizations on a bilateral basis. We also work with them through multilateral venues like uh, CINDI and Science.gov Alliance. And very importantly, the convening power of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy through the Subcommittee on Open Science. And we appreciate the, the work of Dr. Chris Markham there at OSDP in, uh, in pulling us all together. So thank you to all of those. And then going beyond U.S. federal agencies, uh, there are counterpart type organizations of OSTI and other national science organizations in other countries internationally. Uh, and so we have, we've partnered with many of them and we've engaged in information exchange agreements with the International Energy Agency, with the International Atomic Energy Agency. And we interact uh, in a uh, in sort of a, bi a multilateral way where we are exchanging experiences and know-how through the organization, the International Council for Scientific and Technical Information, or ICSTI, and the Worldwide Science Alliance. So a, a huge international activity for us. And finally, the public-private partnerships that we have. Uh, we have adopted many of the uh, leading edge technologies introduced by big companies like Microsoft and IBM and Google into our products. We have smaller companies who serve as our, our support service contractors and are essential part of our mission. We have uh, great partnerships with the publishing uh, community and the professional societies as they complement uh, our collections of DOE information. And last but not least, our partnerships with academia. Uh, and that's also represented in our program today. And that'll be uh, 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 an example where we're bringing in so much world-class talent from some of these graduate programs into OSTI to be part of our workforce and, and to really help us with our mission. So we wanna thank all of the partners, uh, both represented in our program and on the call, and just, just, just to try to emphasize how important those external relationships are. Now, at the beginning of my remarks, I talked about uh, the Department of Energy and uh, specifically the Office of Science. And the director of the Office of Science is Dr. Asmaret Asifal Berhey. And I was thrilled uh, when Dr. Berhey offered to make welcoming remarks to this uh, ceremony and recognizing the unpredictable demands on her time, uh, she offered to make pre-recorded remarks to us. And we have a short video of that and I'd like to play that for you now. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Asmeret Asafal Berhe, Director of the DOE Office of Science. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this celebration of OSTI's 75th anniversary. As we look back on the history and accomplishments of OSTI, we're also looking forward as we prepare to meet the needs of modern science and equitable access to DOE research results. The key to OSTI's success is its collaborative partnering model for collecting and disseminating DOE scientific information. Those include partnerships within DOE, with our national labs and grantee institutions, with other federal science agencies, with academia, professional societies and publishers, and with international partners. And those partnerships are on full display right here among our speakers in this celebration, reflecting their breadth and diversity. Thank you to each of our speakers for joining us today and for sharing, sharing your perspectives. Established as part of the Atomic Energy Commission in 1947, OSTI was key to fulfilling President Roosevelt's 1944 vision of using Manhattan Project research for peaceful purposes after the war. Just imagine the change to the technology used by ASTI to distribute research information as we went from the Atomic Energy Commission to the Energy Research Development Administration and now Department of Energy. OSTI was an early adopter of internet technologies in the mid-1990s, and its web-based discovery tools now reach millions of Americans, including historically underserved communities.
the employees at OSTI are helping DOE achieve the full benefits and meaning of open science. Moving beyond the important scientific publications DOE produces to also include the underlying research data and scientific software, all discoverable with OSTI tools. So I want to thank you all, but especially the former and current OSTI employees, both federal and contractor, on your 75 years of accomplishments and your leadership and innovation and in further accelerating DOE scientific discoveries. Thank you and have a wonderful event. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Bear. Hey, it means so much uh, to to us for you to have made that uh, those remarks, and uh, thank you for your leadership and and actually for the entire SC leadership team which we have on our program today, and that includes uh, your deputy directors, uh, principal deputy director Steve Binkley, Harriet Kung, as I mentioned, and the deputy director for field operations Justin Fontaine. So we appreciate you and SC leadership. And so now uh, it is time to go to our uh, wonderful lineup of speakers that you see spotlighted here. And I, I want to thank each and every <clears throat> one of them for having taken time to uh, make make remarks today and, and prepare for those and to be with us for this special occasion. So I'm going to make quick, quick introductions and I'll make uh, a little more expanded as we go to them individually. Uh, but in the order of their remarks, uh, let me introduce to you Dr. Steve Binkley, Principal De De Deputy Director for the Office of Science, as I mentioned. Uh, Professor Tony Hay, Chief Data Scientist at the UK <laughs> Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. Uh, Yvette Wall, uh, Manager of the Argonne National Research Lab and the uh, Scientific and Technical Information Manager there at Argonne Lab. Our dear friend Jerry Sheehan from the from the National Library of Medicine, who where he's the national where he's the Deputy Director. Uh, and they serve the National Institutes of Health. And then Erica Patillo, Dr. Erica, Erica Patillo, Director of Graduate Studies at the Unity, University of Tennessee's School of Information Science. And we really look forward to hearing from you. So uh, that's our esteemed speakers as a, as a group. And thank you all again. And we'll come to you individually. And so first, I'd like to start off again with uh, one more of our leaders from the Office of Science. And uh, that's Steve Binkley and Steve, we appreciate you, your, you being with us. Steve, uh, I came, first came to know Steve when he was Chief of Staff for SC and then the Associate Director for Advanced Scientific Computing Research. And now for some time as the Principal Deputy Director and he's been a tremendous uh, champion for the OSTE mission. And we really appreciate that, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. <clears throat> um, today we recognize and celebrate the 75th anniversary of the DOE Office of Scientific and Technical Information, OSTI for short, and I'm really pleased to be participating uh, in this event today. Although I'm mostly recognized as a hardcore scientist, I've always been a student of history. And certainly the Manhattan Project and the period immediately following the end of World War II was filled with history. Looking back at the run-up to the legislation that created the Atomic Energy Commission in 1946 was, is, I find it to be very interesting. At that junction of history, the framers of the AEC Act recognized the importance of scientific and technical, technological information that would be created through the funding of the Atomic Energy Commission for research and development activities that would occur in national laboratories that were being created at that time and also funding that would support academic researchers at universities across the United States, and thus OSTI was born. The first national laboratories were, of course, Los Alamos and Oak Ridge that were established actually during the war in 1943. And then after the war, this was followed by the establishment of Argonne National Laboratory in 1946, Ames Lab in and Brookhaven uh, in 1947, in Sandia in 1949. And then the rest of the 17 labs after that, uh, with the most recently established national lab being the Thomas Jefferson National Accelerator Facility, which specializes in nuclear physics, and that was established in 1984. A central theme across all of these laboratories was, of course, a strong focus on the physical sciences, which were so central to the Manhattan Project and to the missions of the Atomic Energy Commission, including chemistry, 
and material sciences, nuclear physics, and uh, other, uh, other activities. In the post-war period, this was extended to high energy and particle physics, as well as uh, to research into the human consequences of radiation, which gave rise to the program that is today recognized as the Biological and Environmental Research Program. The study of potential technologies in thermonuclear fusion were also recognized, and that led to the establishment of the Princeton Plasma Physics uh, Lab in 1951. Finally, starting with the digital computation capabilities pioneered by John von Neumann in the Manhattan Project and later at the Princeton's Institute for Advanced Study, the Office of Science established the Advanced Scientific Computation research program, which presently operates the world's most powerful supercomputer uh, named Frontier, which can perform 10 to the 18 or a billion billion computations per second. Underpinning all of this, and now over for seven decades, has been the Office of Scientific and Technical Information, collecting, aggregating, curating the information produced by the R&D supported by first the Atomic Energy Commission, then the Energy Research and Development Administration, and now the Department of Energy. Obviously, information technologies have advanced at lightning speeds, especially over the past three decades, and OSTI has stood at the frontier of these developments, evolving from records looking much like a classical library to today, a fully digital, fully modern information system. OSTI continues continually pursues new ways to make scientific and technical information more discoverable, uh, easily accessible, and complete than ever before. So with all this said, I commend the progress that OSTI has made over the past seven decades, and I look forward to a future in which OSTI provides tools and services that truly accelerate US research in all the areas uh, that we're involved in. And with that, uh, Brian, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Steve. It, it really means the world to us uh, to, uh, to work with you and the SC leadership team and uh, really to hear those words uh, tying us into that more, that much bigger picture of the National Lab as they evolved and uh, became established and, and uh, really to, to paint that big big science uh, role that we get to play a role in, which we're so happy to do. And again, thank you for your understanding and championship. Uh, Steve has surprised me, or surprised me many, many times where he seems to know even more than I do about the origins of Osti and so forth. So we really appreciate that perspective. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so next, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to uh, Professor Tony Hay, and uh, it's also been a long-standing relationship uh, with Tony uh, that Osti has been the, the the primary beneficiary of. We go all the way, uh, way well back over a decade to when Tony was the head of my, head of Microsoft Research, and we adopted many of the innovations out of the Microsoft Research team into our team uh, into our team like uh, multilingual translations and speech indexing and many others. So. We benefited uh, long ago from uh, Tony and his team there, and uh, uh, then we've uh, certainly stayed in touch with him, and Tony chaired a key subcommittee under one of SC's uh, main advisory committees that led to recommendations for OSTI, and I think he'll talk some about that, but that that has really uh, changed uh, a lot of things for the, for the positive for us, and so we appreciate the investment in that, and now as the uh, UK Rutherford Appleton Laboratory Chief Data Scientist. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to Tony Hay. Thank you very much uh, for your kind introduction, Brian. No, it's great to be here today and to celebrate 75 years of OSTI. And uh, uh, it's it's uh, impressive what you've achieved. So um, I would like to then to start my presentation uh, and Yvette's going to show some slides, I hope. Can we share the slides, Yvette? Thank you. Okay, so next slide, please. So uh, I thought I'd begin with OSTI's mission, uh, and it's to advance science and sustain technological creativity by making R&D findings available and useful, and this is the important part I want to emphasize, 
to DOE researchers and the public, and that's the statement. So when I was asked to uh, chair a, a review committee looking at the uh, looking at Austria's activities and, and the labs, uh, it was a very useful mission for me to have because I needed to put together a committee to do that. And what I really wanted to make sure was that we have librarians at the labs who are well aware what Austria does, but talking to my friends in the research community, many of them were not so aware of what Austria does. And so part of the thing was to get researchers involved in the whole process. Next slide, please. So the history uh, goes back uh, and actually it starts with the uh, with the NIH with their PubMed Central uh, but uh, Jerry can talk about that I'm sure but certainly that I've been watching with admiration what the NIH have been doing on open access for many years so the White House memorandum uh, in 2013 uh, was interesting that it, it wanted increased public access to the results of research and unusually Besides research papers, it made uh, an early definition of what, what the digital data that were needed to be provided to support that research. And you can see the statement there. Uh, it, it isn't everything, but it, it is actually the, 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 the actual data that support the conclusions of the scientific paper. Next slide, please. So that was in 2013. And then this was in 2014, where the uh, the DOE actually responded to that and uh, talked about uh, OSTI launching Pages, a web-based portal providing public access to the accepted peer-reviewed manuscripts. And this was the beginning of, of OSTI's modern incarnation, I would say. And uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, one will see the Pages interface, which was very clearly visible and usable and uh it i think has started the new era of, of osti uh, next slide please so uh a little later than that in november 17 pat damer who was in that uh, acting head of the office of science um asked the committee that i'm on the advanced scientific advisory committee ascac uh to establish a committee to advise the Office of Science on matters associated with OSTI. Uh, and again, to me, as a, as a somewhat of a student of, of, of early history, it was interesting to me that uh, OSTI was to make DOE non-classified research visible and available to the public. And the person who had to do that was General Groves, who was, of course, the person who was responsible for the Manhattan Project and preventing any information about the Manhattan Project being made available to anybody uh, outside the, 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 the project. Uh, but uh, OSTI was established in 47, as we've heard, and the, the responsibilities were defined as the collection, preservation, and dissemination of scientific and technical information from DOEs R and D acti activities. It wasn't DOE in those cases in that days, as we've heard from from Steve. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a, a slide uh, I've stolen from Steve, from Brian, sorry, uh, 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 who responded to our report, uh, and uh, he had the slide of the chronology, uh, the charge letter in November, and and the actual charges about OSTIs, are they products and services best in class? Do they meet the, the current and future needs of customers? And what's the national and international standing of OSTI? And where must it be a clear leader? And then there were subsequent questions that we were asked to look at. Is the mission statement sensible in the light of statutory authorities? Is it organized and staffed to accomplish it? What are the current and planned products? Are they the correct ones, the services? And what suggestions would we make for the next steps? So um, the committee started work. Brian provided a, a briefing of OSTI to the whole of the uh, ASCAC committee in March 2015. And in May 2015, uh, the committee that I put together uh, uh, met and visited uh, OSTI in Oak Ridge uh, and did an on-site review and were shown many interesting things at, at OSTI and we learned quite a lot. And then uh, we followed up and, and, and talked to the various labs and presented 
a report in July, uh, and in September that report was was finally accepted and transmitted to Dr. Dana. Uh, next slide, please. So these were the observations that we made. Uh, a nice summary from from Brian. Um, the best in class product aspects. You, you've heard about the 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 willingness of Osti uh, and Brian to adopt leading edge technologies from that Microsoft Research, where I was based at the time, uh, and other places. But semantic search, audio indexing technology for 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 videos, federated search for science.gov and worldwide science.org and multilingual translation technology, all of which were pioneering uh, technologies to see in products. They, they were actually in research labs and these were actually stable enough to introduce. Um, one of the, uh, the observations was that one of the, uh, the products of Oste at the time was uh, a software technology center ESTSC, and this clearly didn't include some of the major achievements of DOE, such as the uh, Jack Dongara's LA pack from, from Tennessee, and, and also the MPI effort from Argonne, and that they were not, not included, yet they are some of the most influential pieces of software that DOE have produced. Um, and then What was quite clear from the uh, uh, the groups that that, that Osti addressed was it did well at addressing the librarians. It did not too bad with the public, but researchers were really rather ignorant, and they regarded as Osti as getting in the way of what they wanted to do, and hadn't understood the rationale and why we were doing it. And so, researchers were the people we had to reach out to, and um, we we think that. Uh, Osti had a very enthusiastic team and could take on this, this challenge. Uh, next, next slide, please. So the recommendations that the, the, that the committee made were, were a vigorous outreach program with the lab researchers to make sure they knew about Oxy. Osti wasn't imposing extra, extra conditions on their research. Osti was actually trying to help them make their research more visible. And, and working with the librarians at the labs and with the researchers, I think Osti have certainly done that. Um, and they have, second uh, bullet is to reinvent the, the software service. And as you'll see in a moment, they've done that remarkably well. Uh, strengthen the links to researchers, uh, unified environment of, of, of the tools that Osti produce, make it clearer, uh, improve the, the interface and uh, with the librarians and researchers, identify any contact ga gaps that were available and, and make sure that the submission requirements were quite clear. Next slide, please. We also made some recommendations to the Office of Science. Um, and if, in order to promote a successful implication, implementation of the public access requirements for DOE, uh, OSTE needed to work with the labs and uh, what was agreed that it would be one incentive for the labs would be to have a measurable expectation in the labs annual performance lab, lab plans. And as you'll see, that was really, I think, quite, quite successful. Um, we also thought that, that OSTE could play a role in managing the data that is uh, supporting the papers, the, the supporting data, and exactly how that was was to be determined, uh, and uh, we suggested various possibilities. And you'll see what OSTE have done in that. So those were the slides that uh, Brian produced in a response to our report in December 2015. So if I could have the next slide, please. Um, specific outcomes of the report. Well, OSTI have gone around doing exactly what we asked them to do, holding, holding workshops with researchers at the labs to gain their input on the dissemination products and the researcher services that are needed and that they want. And the results, are, I think, are quite impressive. They've developed, instead of uh, ESTSC, the DOE code uh, repository, which is... Uh, the largest software repository, scientific software repository in the US government. Uh, and in addition, 
they now uh, have a, a service for assigning digital object identifiers to software projects. And so DOE code is, I think, a state of the art um, piece of uh, software and, and, and a valuable tool. They've also done uh, uh, some of the, the recommendations in the area of services for data and expanded persistent identifiers, uh, PIDs for open science. Uh, and uh, in terms of statistics, they've now issued over 150,000 DOIs for the DOE data sets. And they also collaborate with ORCID. And they've also looked at the piloting the assignment of DOIs to awards, DOE awards. So I think that's, for me, a, a, an impressive and satisfying outcome. What progress has been made towards making all the publications of DOE available to the public? Uh, well, part what they did was establish a partnership with the publishers, uh, and the publishers, by and large, have, have, have played their part. Uh, and so the DOE authors provide the data to OST, but the publisher's participation of providing the, the, the version of record uh, uh, has increased the overall public access rates by 15% from the, 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 the submissions that the authors actually make. And so we now have a total of about 80% public access to DOE funded publications. And I seem to remember with the PubMed Central when they had uh, uh, a requirement for submitting NIH funded research publications. It took some time for them to get over 80%. And uh, Jerry presumably can tell us more about that. But they, in, in the end, uh, to get essentially 100%, they introduced uh, the possibility of delaying your next NIH grant. And that really concentrated the minds of researchers. We, we have actually done that in a, in a different way by partnering with the DOE labs and the librarians at the labs with OSTI and the researchers and 80% public access is a pretty good number. Next slide, please. Okay, so one of the things that I wondered was whether the number of DOIs, digital object identifiers for connecting research papers to the supporting data, has it dramatically increased? Well, there are now over 260,000 records uh, in OSTI.gov that have related identifiers either to research papers or, or other research products like data papers. Uh, and there are now uh, nearly 4,000 relationships with the data records themselves. So I think that's a pretty impressive start uh, from zero to get to uh, the, these sort of numbers. And so I think the, D, the, the DOI service that they provide is, is proving to be a very valuable and, and useful thing for establishing public access with the supporting data as in the memo in 2013. Um, the results then, OSTI and the labs have worked together to identify the levels of compliance that, that for the public access. And in 2015, when it was added to the lab's annual performance evaluation, uh, it was thought reasonable to have a goal of 85% as a target for the uh, compliance of the open access to the, the publications. And almost all of the 17 DOE labs are now at or very near that goal. And that's a really impressive achievement. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, that brings us up to date. And, and so in August this year, there was a second OSTP memo on public access, ensuring free, immediate and equitable access to federally funded research. And it asked the agencies to update their public access policies, not later than 2025. Um, uh, and it was what a, the attempt was, instead of having an embargo of six or 12 months by the publishers before that became open access, it was to make them instantly accessible uh, without the embargo time. Uh, and since the US, in a, in a recent report from the NSF, uh, you can find that in 2018, the US published about 17% of the world's uh, peer-reviewed scientific and engineering articles. And that's a significant number. And uh, Europe has a similar number. And, and so this OSTP directive 
will have a, a major impact on, on publishers and research globally. So it's a really uh, bold move uh, by the um, OSTP and the research agencies in the US, who I think are leaders in this, in this field. So I would like to say a little bit then about uh, where I see the future. And next slide, please. So I think that many agencies have adopted the FAIR principles, data should be findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And that all sounds great. Uh, and um, most agencies have at least given lip service to, to this. But actually making data FAIR in the way that was envisaged uh, will take some time. And uh, one of the things that particularly interests me is the interoperability, um, because the FAIR proposers were very keen that the metadata associated uh, with the publication or the data set should be machine readable. So, uh, you know, the machine can do the collating, bringing pet data sets and publications together, rather than uh, the individual researchers having to do the work by hand. So I'll just say a few words very, very quickly about the technology that I see could be useful. Uh, next slide, please. So when I was at Microsoft, I apologize for the slide being very small, but let me, it, it is really about the organization called schema.org. It was the only standards body that Microsoft and Google ever agreed on while I was there. And basically, it was a way that you can actually add uh, small bits of metadata to your website to tell you that when I'm searching for Casablanca, it, it instead of having to scrape the website to find out whether it's actually the place in North Africa, or whether it's the movies with Humphrey Bogart, you can find that out. Uh, and so this is a much easier machine readable way of finding it. this website is about the movies and that website is about uh, Casablanca, the place, for example. So it's a small vocabulary. You can put it in the metadata for, on the website and it can be read by machines and makes search engines a much easier job, much more relevant. It also increases interoperability if you have an agreed vocabulary, you, you can then pick up, for example, in our case, data sets, which are relevant together. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the semantic web community uh, have very uh, bold plans, but I think they are rather, uh, dare I say it, computer science-y plans, they're, 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 they're rather uh, idealistic, whereas as you see, schema.org is a very pragmatic, small step to adding semantics to web pages. And this is uh, bioschemas is what this biological community have done. Uh, they've introduced a small vocabulary into schema.org. You can add your own vocabulary terms in it, and then you can actually then the next slide. You can make that a visible in Google's data set search and the bio schemas people work very hard to make sure that the, the things they were adding would be picked up in the way by Google's data set search. So that will be found by data sets. You can find out what the data sets about. You can find similar data sets and so on. So it really increases visibility, findability, but also the potential for interoperability. And next slide. And it uses a rather standard tool, JSON, for, for linking data. So JSON-LD is, is the tool of record, and it helps you produce linking data sets. Uh, it doesn't have all the semantic information, but it does provide that and provides valuable links. You can build a knowledge graph and so on. So this is a very straightforward technology, which is understood by many people. It doesn't have to be a computer science PhD to understand this. It's actually the here and now, and that's what uh, the bio community have done. And I think it's a model for what other communities might want to do. Next slide, please. So the, the other thing of value is a, approach on schema.org. It's very easy to put your data in this format using schema.org's types, and it makes it easy for people to uh, to mark up their, their, their site and to be picked up by Google's data set. And so it actually makes it much easier, doesn't require a huge amount of work to make data sets visible uh, in, in data set search. So it can actually not, not only do the big data sets, it can also do the long tail of small data sets. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so this is a slide from one of my uh, colleagues at Microsoft when I was there. Uh, what's a data scientist? Well, there are various types of data scientists. There's data engineers who go and actually do the, the actual technical work, low level, close to the data. There's data analysts who use things like machine learning, deep learning, and so on to actually go and uh, uh, find patterns and, 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 and new science from the scientific data. And there's also the data stewards, the people who manage, curate, and preserve the data. And uh, these roles, I think, are, are going to be increasingly important in the move towards fair data. So this is my vision for Austi's future. Next slide, please. It's also the future of research libraries. And there's an organization of research libraries called LIBA. And it, saw, it sees a role of libraries in the future in four key areas connected with the research infrastructure. Shared services and cloud services, semantic interoperability, open and linked data, data stewardship, and disciplinary partnerships. And I think those are things that are very important also for the OSTE uh, and the DOE Labs community. By developing skills like these in research data management, I believe OSTI will continue to play a central role in supporting research at the labs. The move will require some of the OSTI and the, the scientific information, tactical information program staff to be acting as domain specific data stewards who can work collaboratively with research scientists, but also software engineers and data scientists of all varieties need to be included in this process. So I think OSTI in the future will be able to play a central role in supporting scientists in coping with the requirements of creating fair data sets, which have actionable metadata and some semantics. So I think it's an interesting and exciting future. And I, I look forward to seeing what OSTI does in, in the next few years. So it's been a great pleasure to work with Brian and the OSTI team and, and also uh, with the DOE and uh, the uh, Advanced Scientific Computing Advisory Committee. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure working with OSTI. So thank you, Tony, uh, and what a great presentation, a keynote presentation that uh, <clears throat> both touched on the past and, and the influence of, of the subcommittee that you chaired and, and the actions that we took to improve things, but also appreciating just your, 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 your futurist approach and, and thinking about how we can further uh, uh, integrate and, and work with the research efforts uh, we have. We certainly have uh, good friends and colleagues uh, as, uh, leading the uh, research data side of things in the Office of Science, and we're very much in touch with them and want to be continue to be integrated with them. So this gives us a lot of food for thought. And we take you, uh, thank you again for taking the time to be with us, and I'm sure we'll want to uh, stay in touch with you about that. Uh, so thank you to both uh, Steve and Tony for those opening presentations. Uh, and what we'd like to do now is to take a brief interlude uh, between our speakers and play for you a short video that we have uh, produced along with a, a very talented uh, video producer named uh, Katie Jones. Uh, and this video takes a look, a look back on Osti's past, uh, some of the history and, uh, and the wonderful things that came out of the Man Project, Manhattan Project and after that, as well as uh, the current uh, challenges of open science and, and where we wanna head in the future. So uh, uh, we'd like to play that video for you now. Scientific discovery takes place every day at U.S. national laboratories and universities as researchers wield the power of supercomputers, particle accelerators, and advanced microscopes. With these and other modern tools and with billions of dollars of research funding each year from the U.S. Department of Energy, scientists are generating more information and insight than ever before. At DOE's Office of Scientific and Technical Information, or OSTI, we serve a vital role in preserving this growing body of knowledge and making it accessible to the public. Now, on our 75th anniversary, our collection exceeds 3 million records and counting, and we have exciting innovations planned for the future. But first, let's look at where we started. World War II, the Manhattan Project, and the dawn of the atomic energy age 
led to the creation of many research facilities, programs, and resources. Following the war, scientists eagerly developed ways for nuclear science to help humankind in energy, medicine, and industry. At the time, presidential science advisor Vannevar Bush recognized this endless frontier of research and advised that the government should accept new responsibilities for promoting the flow of new scientific knowledge. To fulfill this vision, DOE's predecessor, the Atomic Energy Commission, established OSTI in 1947 to share U.S. nuclear science research with the public. Over the course of the 20th century, and with the formation of DOE, our mission expanded to include energy-related research across many scientific disciplines. OSTI became a national gateway to new and often groundbreaking scientific knowledge. For the first 50 years, we disseminated information manually through hard copies of scientific publications and other documents, physically sent to thousands of libraries. Then the very scientific progress we were cataloging spurred the information revolution, and with it, the shift to digital records. At OSTI, we embraced this technology to serve the public good. Notably, the internet amplified the need for open science, that is, free and ready access to research results, which was one of our guiding principles from the start. Open science promotes transparency in the research process, accelerates innovation, and drives competitiveness for the nation. As an early leader in open science, we improved how DOE research is accessed on commercial search engines. And we adopted digital markers known as persistent identifiers to permanently link related sources like papers and data sets. The internet also allowed us to share new forms of information, making for a far richer collection that promotes transparency and reproducibility in science. Today, we manage data sets, software, multimedia, and more. We also digitally preserve our legacy physical documents. Our primary search engine is osti.gov, which is a unified portal to all our collections across the last 75 years. Looking to the future, we know technology will evolve with incredible opportunities ahead. We are already using cutting edge techniques like artificial intelligence to refine search capabilities, improve metadata quality, and link sources in new and eye-opening ways. Discovery is only beginning at OSTI, and the potential for advancement of science is endless. Okay, so I uh, hope you enjoyed that video. It was a lot of fun for us to produce. Uh, and um, some of the photographs there are really uh, visually uh, interesting. And you saw some from the, our early days and uh, you certainly see uh, what the facility looks like today and what we're using for it in modern science. And uh, for anyone who doesn't know, that facility is right here in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Uh, and it does reflect uh, some decisions that were made, uh, I think, as some of our earlier speakers mentioned, that uh, after the Manhattan Project was over and there was a decision to ma made to uh, transition this, the science behind the Manhattan Project from wartime to peacetime and the establishment of the Energy, Atomic Energy Commission and, the, and this new centralized information function, it needed to be uh, determined where, was it, where would this function go? And since so much of the research uh, had happened here in Oak Ridge, this seemed like a natural home for it. And, it, and it's where it's been where we've uh, been located for these 75 years. Uh, we are kind of a different animal in the government in that we are technically considered a headquarters organization with this DOE wide mission, uh, but, but primarily physically located here in, field, in the field in the Oak Ridge area. We do have a small team of uh, OSTE employees in headquarters, and they do a great job, and we appreciate that. But most of our, our staff is here uh, in the Oak Ridge area. And we have been uh, uh, beneficiaries, I think, of being here in town and being 
close to the other major players in town and partners for, with us. And of course, that includes the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, one of the 17 uh, DOE national labs with whom, from whom we collect uh, their scientific information, information and make it accessible. It includes the Y-12 National Security Complex, Oak Ridge Associated Universities, and then all of the DOE federal colleagues at the site office for those for those major facilities, and also the uh, the consolidated service center under SC that is here. And so we appreciate all of those colleagues. I saw, I saw, I saw a good friend on our Zoom here, Jeff Doubleclair, is a deputy at the service center. So uh, Jeff, we appreciate you and your colleagues in that. And certainly, I want to extend our appreciation and thanks to the city leaders of Oak Ridge, the city council, Mayor Warren Gooch. Uh, for making this such a great place to uh, work and to live. So thank you all, uh, and we're happy to be part of this community. So now I would like to return to our speakers, uh, and uh, next I would like to introduce, introduce to you uh, Yvette Wohl, who is the manager of Argonne National Labs Research Library and a member of uh, the Scientific and Technical Information Program, where she's the STI manager at Argonne, and she's been such a central player in the success of that network uh, with our labs. And uh, Yvette, uh, we'd love to hear from you now. Thank you, Brian. So good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to speak with you today as a representative of the library community within the Department of Energy's National Laboratory Network, and also as a representative of OSTI's Scientific and Technical Information Program. When Brian and Judy first reached out to me asking if I would agree to speak at today's 75th anniversary celebration, I thought it would be interesting to start with some historical background. Bringing DOE funded research to the public had some of its earliest beginnings with a paper publication called Nuclear Science Abstracts. But what some people might not know is that prior to the release of Nuclear Science Abstracts, three other abstract journals were issued by the Atomic Energy Commission's Information Branch, which preceded OSTI. Those publications were entitled Abstracts of Declassified Documents, Atomic Energy in Foreign Countries, and The Guide to Published Research on Atomic Energy. The Guide to Published Research on Atomic Energy issued its first monthly issue on November 15, 1946, and it wasn't available to the general public. Its distribution was limited to persons employed by the Atomic Energy Commission and its contractors. And the reason was that the contents of each issue were actually sourced from other society and commercial publications, such as chemical abstracts and physics abstracts. Less than two years later, on July 14, 1948, when nuclear science abstracts began publication, there'd been a number of refinements to the process from the previous guide. There had been a name change, and OSTI's predecessor was now called the Technical Information Division. The publishing schedule had increased to monthly from, or to bi-weekly from the monthly, and the publication was no longer limited to atomic energy employees and contractors. The abstracts were compiled in-house at Oak Ridge, from declassified reports of the Atomic Energy Commission and from journal articles pertaining to atomic energy. At the end of each year, there would be two cumulative indices, one arranged by subject and one arranged by title. And this allowed librarians and researchers the opportunity to search an entire year at one time. And that was great as opposed to searching through each individual issue. Compare that with the OSTI databases of today, where you can search more than 3 million records covering more than 70 years of research and retrieve your results in a matter of seconds. What a difference 75 years makes and what a remarkable contribution by OSTI. I began my library career as a science reference librarian at Argonne National Laboratory in the 1980s and I regularly consulted nuclear science abstracts to track down information. I quickly learned that there were two things that set OSTI indexing tools apart from other services. First of all, OSTI indexes more than just journal articles. 
Osti has always had a commitment to index what we librarians refer to as the gray literature, by which I mean technical reports, conference papers, talks, presentations, software, patents, and today, data sets. In fact, the very first entry that appeared in Volume 1, Issue 1 of Nuclear Science Abstracts was a testament to that scope of coverage. It was an entry describing a technical report produced by Argonne in 1944, declassified in 1948, and announced to the public through Nuclear Science Abstracts. The second quality that sets OSTI apart from its competitors is that OSTI provides indexing and abstracting services free of charge. Unlike other commercial distributors, there are no subscription paywalls to access the OSTI databases. OSTI's commitment to making DOE-funded research more broadly accessible goes beyond just indexing and abstracting services, however. In the early years of its existence, as shown in one of the slides in our last video, OSTI would also, was also instrumental in building physical library collections devoted to the energy sciences. In the absence of a World Wide Web, such as we have today, distributing the full text of non-journal publications back in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and even into the 1980s, meant shipping publications to libraries across the country. At Argonne, for example, we'd receive boxes of publications from OSTI almost weekly. We'd catalog them, shelve them, and thus make them available to our scientists and engineers. It was a very labor-intensive operation, but by the time print and microfiche documents were replaced with online access, OSTI had supplied Argonne with almost a million microfiche and print publications. Many of these items have never been digitized and they continue to supply, but they continue to supply researchers with access in the form of paper and microfiche to obscure but important historical research results. Osti's role in making DOE funded research more visible to the general public is undeniable, but where does Osti gather the content that they distribute? From the beginning of its existence, OSTI has maintained a variety of partnerships with other agencies and publishers, both here and abroad, as you've heard already mentioned in some of our previous presentations. But much of the content contained in OSTI databases is derived from a consortium called the Scientific and Technical Information Program, or STIP. STIP is administered by OSTI, and in addition to OSTI personnel, it includes information professionals at the 17 national laboratories, program offices, and site offices who work collectively to fulfill DOE's responsibility to disseminate publications and data sets resulting from research supported by DOE. Each national laboratory has a designated representative to serve as a point of contact between the site and OSTI. The duties of each of these STIP managers vary slightly from site to site, but in general, each STIP manager, of which I'm one, is responsible for ensuring that publications authored by researchers at their respective sites receives an appropriate institutional review prior to release and coordinating contractor compliance and announcing the information products to OSTI. In addition to implementing DOE requirements, the STIP managers work closely with OSTI to mint, implement federally mandated public access initiatives. Since 2014, national laboratories have been supplying publisher accepted manuscripts of scholarly articles to OSTI, and this collaborative effort has supported OSTI's ability to make these manuscripts publicly available through DOE pages. And as Tony mentioned, yes, all or most of the laboratories have now reached that my that magic 85% target for submissions. Administering such a collaborative program with sites scattered across the country requires extensive communication among the members. And OSTI has over the years excelled at keeping members informed of new requirements and best practices. In addition to leading their bi-monthly stipped teleconferences, OSTI has taken a leading role in establishing special interest groups 
such as the Data ID Services Community and the ORCID Consortium for Government Institutions. The greatest opportunity to strengthen the STIP partnership, however, is when members of the STIP community gather annually at in-person STIP working meetings. Our annual meeting is hosted in a member sites and provides participants with an opportunity to hear what's new at OSTI and what new services and technologies are being adopted at the member sites. While the pandemic interrupted our schedule, we will be resuming these meetings in April, 2023, when Argonne National Laboratory will be the host. Today, we celebrate the 75th anniversary of OSTI's creation and the key role that OSTI has played over the years in preserving and distributing energy-related information. There are many challenges and changes on the horizon, and the STIP community looks forward to working with OSTI in meeting those challenges. In closing, I'd like to thank the wonderful team at OSTI, both past and present. You've been extremely helpful over the years, and I congratulate each and every one of you on a job well done. Congratulations on your 75th anniversary. Brian, back to you. Thanks, thanks so much, Yvette. And those are wonderful comments. And um, <clears throat> thank you for kind of walking us through uh, so many technological changes that have occurred over the years to uh, collect this information and to provide it in ways that are more useful to the public. And uh, I just want to say how much you mean to us <clears throat> personally there at Argonne, but also uh, for your leadership of this department-wide program that you just mentioned, uh, where uh, uh, not only are you highlighting Argonne's contributions, but really uh, leading a lot of discussions that lead all 17 national labs to operate uh, consistently. Uh, there are obviously some variations from one to another, uh, but your leadership there is uh, hugely impactful. So thank you for that. Um, so next, uh, I would like to uh, move to our next speaker, uh, Jerry Sheehan, Deputy Director of National Library of Medicine at uh, NIH. Uh, NIH, uh, NLM in particular, is a benchmark for scientific and medical research information to us. Uh, Jerry probably thinks Austin's just a babe in the woods at 75 years old with uh, NLM established in 1836. Uh, and we all we all look to NLM to be such a benchmark in this area. So uh, it's great to count Jerry as a friend and we look forward to hearing from Jerry. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. I appreciate the invitation today. and. And I'm excited to be part of this, this opportunity to, to recognize and celebrate OSTI's 75th anniversary. We may be larger and a little bit older than OSTI, uh, those of us at the National Library of Medicine, but um, I'm often struck by the parallels between our, our organizations. We both trace our history and our origins to defined collections of material. For OSTI, as you said, from the Manhattan Project, for NLM, it was a collection of books in the office of the U.S. Army Surgeon General back in 1836. We have both gone through uh, our fair share of organizational changes, renamings, repositionings of our organizations over time. But we've both maintained an ability to stay, I think, on the cutting edge of new trends, new technologies, new forms of scholarly communication, and I, I think have emerged as leaders and leading organizations for disseminating scientific and technical information, both as we're celebrating today, preserving the past and preparing us for the future and trying to ensure that we stay up with all of these, these trends. I think, we, I think we also both share a commitment to making information and data available for our research communities, as well as for entrepreneurs and businesses, policymakers, students and educators, the general public, really anyone who can make productive use of the information, the research information and results that we, that we produce, our agencies produce. So maybe it's no surprise uh, that we've been such good partners uh, over, over many, many years. And uh, in fact, as we've heard of, of the many accomplishments of OSTI today, just over its 75 year history, what, what I wanna try to add is some perspective on what OSTI has meant to the larger federal interagency community as a partner and, and a leader in improving access to scientific and technical information. As I said, I've had the pleasure of working with OSTI uh, from the beginning of my time in federal government, which is quickly approaching 20 years. Uh, but our NLM interactions 
started well before then, as did the interactions of many of the other federal science agencies and information dissemination agencies. In fact, I took a few moments in preparing for today's event to poll some of our colleagues from across the federal government, people that I know who've worked closely with OSTE over the years, from organizations such as the National Science Foundation, the National Transportation Library, the National Agricultural Library, the Department of Education, and NOAA, among, among many more. And I'm going to intersperse a few of their remarks and perspectives along with my own observations uh, this, this morning. I think the first point to make, though, that is that all of these colleagues from across the agencies echoed a common, several common themes about OSTE, and it was maybe best summed up by our colleagues, Martin Halbert and Alan Tompkins at the National Science Foundation, who said, you know, OSTE has been a trusted and valued partner in sharing scientific information with the public. Indeed, I think we would all agree you've been a leader in promoting access to scientific and technical information, but also in helping other federal agencies to do the same and to do it better. And I think to, to appreciate the role that OSTE has played over these many years, uh, one needs to look no farther than SENDI, right? This is the Organization of Federal Scientific and Technical Information Managers. OSTE was one of the founders of this collaborative. In fact, they are the E in SENDI, for, which stands for energy. What's impressive is that a voluntary multi-agency collaboration that was established in the mid-1980s right, continues to serve as an important forum for information exchange almost 40 years later. And over this time, its membership has grown well beyond the commerce energy, NASA, and defense organizations that formed it, uh, but now to a total of 14 uh, agencies. Let's say NLM was one of the, the early uh, joiners and one of the second ends, I think, in CENDI. But this organization um, has been fueled and powered by a lot of contributions from OSTE. Um, no surprise, OSTE has been is the, the engine behind CENDI's probably most visible collaboration by serving as the operating agent for science.gov, which was mentioned earlier today, a federated search engine that operates across 60 different agency databases and more than 2,000 scientific websites to provide our authoritative information to all of those who can use it. As Mary Moulton, colleague from the Department of Transportation, National Transportation Library noted, especially for small agencies like theirs, science.gov has been a, a, a way to enable them to disseminate their research information and data to a much larger audience than they could otherwise attract. And to people who might not know whether the information is, lies within the Transportation Library, the Department of Energy, or elsewhere in the federal government. It's become a de facto website as well for promoting interagency coordination on public access, which Dr. Hay and others have mentioned, the policies that ensure that our public has free access to the published results of our funded research. It was at the response to a request from the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy that science.gov began aggregating all the public access plans of all the federal agencies, probably back in 2015, as they were first being written. And science.gov has developed a, a tailored search across the full text journal article repositories that the, those agencies support. I think as Dr. Hay and others have mentioned, you know, OSTE has, has taken this model of interagency collaboration to an international scale uh, through its participation and really its leadership within the International Council for Scientific and Technical Information, or ICSTE, to which the National Library of Medicine is also uh, a longstanding member. Brian, uh, individually, I think, co-chairs one or two of the, the working groups that have done uh, an incredible job of ensuring that all of the organizations within ICSD keep up to date on new developments in both policy around open science and public access, as well as in new technologies that can help support them. And of course, through platforms like Worldwide Science, they've taken this model of science.gov and taken it internationally with, as Dr. Hay mentioned, multi-language uh, lingual translation to help us make use of, of research results from around the world. I think OSTE's interagency leadership and collaboration is, has continued into the current era of, of public and now equitable access to the results of federally funded research. 
Asti was one of the co-chairs, in fact, of the interagency working group that created the objectives for access to peer-reviewed publications that were embedded in that 2013 OSTP memorandum on, on increasing public access to the results of federally funded research. As Dr. Hay and others have, have mentioned, Asti was very quick to develop uh, its new software and tooling for its, its public access gateway to energy and science, the PAGES system, that was a, a very novel approach to meeting the objectives of the memo. But on the theme of interagency collaboration, Asti didn't just develop it and run it for itself. Right? Asti has shared the tooling, the software, and the platforms with other agencies like DOD, I believe also the National Science Foundation and others to help them support their public access initiatives. And today, Asti is playing a key role in implementing the new guidance from the new OSTP memo to ensure free, immediate, and equitable access to federally funded research results. In a newly rechartered National Science and Technology Council subcommittee on open science, we will be playing a key role in coordinating interagency efforts to meet the new guidance. And not surprisingly, Asti has a, a leadership role in helping work across the agencies and identifying areas for cooperation and bringing good and new practice. Asti, in the form of Brian Hitson, co-chairs a publication working group that's looking at ways to make publications available in machine-readable formats to enable artificial intelligence and machine learning approaches of the kinds that have been discussed this morning. The group also identified models for streamlining ways of submitting articles into the many different agency repositories to improve our own operations and compliance measures, but also to help reduce the burden on the research community. Not only did Brian help shepherd that work, but Asti has adopted one of those models and in fact has a good collaboration with the National Library of Medicine now in making use of our open access subset from our PubMed Central uh, repository to help augment the, the DOE collections. Asti in the form of Carly Robinson is co-chairing a group, uh, a subgroup on persistent identifiers that is helping us identify and interlink various research objects. Uh, this was mentioned before, uh, Asti's persistent identifier services, which in fact are supporting several NIH activities and research programs by assigning digital object identifiers. As one of my colleagues from NSF, Martin Halbert, said the, the leadership of, of OSTI in fostering widespread adoption of foundational open science standards such as persistent identifiers has been instrumental in the overall advancement of information services nationwide. And I think we all look to OSTI for its leadership in that area. Somehow they do all of this on a budget that's a lot smaller than the National Library of Medicine's budget. And they've been able to do so, as, as has been discussed today, through the use of innovative new technologies and partnerships, not only across government, but with the private sector. I think the key to their success, though, including in their interagency collaboration, uh, it has to be its talented staff. Asti has been fortunate to have visionary, effective leadership. I've had the pleasure in my career to know and work with two of those leaders, Walt Warnick and, and now Brian Hitson. Uh, who've been great partners and great collaborators and have a knack for attack, attracting and retaining incredibly talented staff. Again, I've had the pleasure of working with people like Carly Robinson, Laurie Apple, Lance Vowell, Yvette Wallace, Joanna Martin, and there are many, many more, many of you here in the audience today who I'm sure I'm, I'm forgetting to name, but have, have been uh, strong proponents of public access, open science, and all that OSTI has done. done. And this was another theme that all of my interagency colleagues echoed as well. It was Paul Wester, the director of the National Agriculture Library, who said, Asti's thoughtful, inclusive, and accessible leadership, these are personal characteristics, but they seem to be a hallmark of Asti's approach historically. I would echo that. Liz Albro, the commissioner for education research at the Institute of Education Sciences within the Department of Education, complimented the OSTI team on their amazingly helpful and patient uh, approach as they've worked together on issues around persistent identifiers in the Department of Education. I think this is exactly the kind of teaming and partnership that we look forward to as we work to address our future challenges. We are at an interesting point of time in regards to scholarly communication and access to research results. It's marked by an interest in accelerating 
access to the results of research, as Dr. Hay mentioned, and doing so in ways that are equitable to all users and all potential submitters of information. Publishing itself and scholarly communication is changing. We've got the growth of open access publications. We have growing interest in things like preprints that are beginning to, to reshape our thinking about version of record becoming more a record of versions of the written outputs of, of research projects. There's a growing recognition that the results of research extend well beyond publications to include things like data and code and models and study protocols. And there's an interest in providing access to all of this information and interconnecting it in ways that will enable discovery and interpretation of research as part of a growing open science enterprise. So these are the challenges that we need to address in the future, and it'll take some new technology, innovative new approaches, and, and new partnerships and collaborations. Asti has been, as you've heard, working in a number of these areas already, and I think all of us in the federal interagency community will be looking to work and collaborate uh, with Asti even more as we try to address these challenges together. I think what Asti has accomplished in its last 75 years really sets the stage for a whole set of new innovative products and services to come and interagency collaboration. And so on behalf of myself and all of our interagency colleagues, Brian and others, uh, we want to celebrate with you your 75th anniversary, and we all look forward to continuing to work with you over the next 75 years and beyond. Uh, so thank, let me thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my perspectives and, and those of the interagency community. Thanks. Thank you, Jerry. And uh, I swear, if it was if it was legal to hire you as a lobbyist, uh, we, <laughs> we would do that. Uh, and uh, but really, uh, thank you for checking in with some other agencies just to kind of get their perspectives, uh, and just to say uh, it's tantamount of importance to us uh, that we keep our close collaborations with uh, NLM working. So look forward to working with you on that and the other challenges that you mentioned. So thank you for being here. Uh, so now I would like to go to our final speaker, and um, I just want to say it's Dr. Erica Patillo again, uh, Director of Graduate Studies, UT School of Information and Science at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And um, it's been a, a tremendous relationship there where we are uh, constantly uh, learning from and gaining tremendous talent from that school, and we look forward to hearing uh, Dr. Patillo talk about that. Hello, everyone. I am bringing greetings from the School of Information Sciences at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, particularly from the Master of Science and in Information Sciences program. And to some extent, I'm representing OSTE's broader academic partnerships. Congratulations to OSTE for 75 years of finding innovative ways to bring Department of Energy funded research and development results to the public. When I started working at SIS in 2020, the only Asti I was familiar with was Asti Spumante, the Martini and Rossi Italian sparkling wine. I quickly learned that I was the one who had been missing out. Or I should say, I was uninformed that the hard work going on behind the scenes of sites and services such as science.gov and DOE pages which I had used in my previous role as an academic librarian was being done by an organization called OSTI. But isn't that often the case that librarians and other information professionals are working their expert magic behind the scenes while others are out in front um, getting the glory, the information professionals are toiling in the background to make sure everything works as it should. Allow me to shed some light on something else very important that Asti is doing that might be behind the scenes for some of you, but is front and center for me and for several students and faculty at the School of Information Sciences. Asti is an important partner with SIS in the preparation of our students to meet the challenges in library and information sciences careers. So again, when I started in 2020, and I was trying to learn my jobs as practicum coordinator and director of the MSIS program, I kept seeing these letters OSTI following the names of 
part-time lecturers. I saw those letters in practicum applications and in job ads posted to our jobs list. So here's what I learned. Current OSTE employees teach our courses in our MSIS program. They serve on our board of visitors. They participate with our student organization chapters and they host practicum opportunities for our students. Also, some of our graduates, around 100 of our graduates, according to Director Hitson, have found full-time employment with the organization, either directly as federal employees or as contractors through companies like Key Logic, formerly known as Information International Associates, which was founded by Bonnie Carroll, one of our graduates and a former OSTE employee. This strong relationship has developed thanks to the scholarship and administrative work of many information sciences professionals, particularly SIS faculty, such as Dr. Carol Tenniper and Dr. Susie Allard. For example, Tenniper and Allard secured half a million dollars in grant funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services for their Sci Data Master's Program Initiative in 2012. The Sci Data Program was designed to respond to the increased need for professionals who specialize in scientific data curation, research, and education. Allard and Tenniper recognized the need for professionals specifically trained in the management and curation of scientific data. One of the partners for the Sci Data Project was the Office of Scientific and Technical Information. OSI employees served as practicum hosts for this multi-year trend-setting initiative. OSTE team members continue to support the professional goals of our students by sharing their world-class expertise in information sciences, particularly open access, discoverability, and metadata standards and the practical applications of those standards. They are also excellent mentors who help prepare our students for real work experiences and for government job opportunities. So we at SIS ask our practicum students to reflect on their experiences at the end of each term. I thought I'd share some comments from um, some students who have participated with their practicum at OSTE. I was able to work with multiple members of the information science team at OSTE on different projects. I was supervised by the head of the team, mentored by another member of the team, and I had the opportunity to collaborate with four other team members. I was also able to attend team and OSTE all hands meetings, which gave me insights into what it would be like to work at OSTE. And another comment. This was an amazing opportunity. Everyone at OSTE was incredibly nice and helpful. I learned so many new skills that will benefit me in my future career. I would highly recommend OSTE as a practicum site to students in the future. So congratulations on 75 years. Um, even if a lot of the work that you do remains in the background for most of the public, Know that your expertise and commitment to high standards and to training the next generation of information professionals is extremely important work. It is highly valued. And for us at SIS, it is not hidden. I am honored to have a small part in helping to continue this relationship. And we are honored to have been included in marking this extraordinary milestone. So here's to the next 75 years and to our continued partnership. And now, should I ever come across a bottle of Asti Spumante, I will forever think of the real Asti, the Office of Scientific and Technical Information of the Department of Energy. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. That was great. I love the Asti Spumante and Asti. I hope we're as bubbly as uh, some of those bottles. Uh, so, uh, but nonetheless, uh, you've highlighted what is what is really critical to our relationship. Um, and uh, we, we we are constantly learning what uh, the new uh, challenges in the information science world are, and that's reflected in the students that uh, come to OSTE. 
as we benefit greatly from, from their education there in the program. And uh, so thank you for helping with that. Uh, we look forward to, as you say, many more years of cooperation where our workforce benefits from your work there. Uh, so thanks again to all of our speakers. You've done a great job. I've tried to uh, email you or chat with you just to, just to kind of pass on my uh, appreciation, but uh, it really does mean a lot to us for you all to take time out of your busy schedules. You all are extremely busy people, uh, but just to help us commemorate this anniversary, it's meant so much to us. So thank you for that. Um, so this kind of brings us to the end of our program. Um, I want to go back to my original opening where I talked about the OSTI philosophy and, and the importance of relationships and partnerships with the external stakeholders and, and customers and communities that mean much to our mission. The other part of that philosophy uh, was having a dedicated, uh, talented workforce. So if, you, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to uh, talk to that dedicated, talented workforce uh, here for a minute. Uh, and just uh, talk about uh, what they mean to our success. And, and that involves a, little, a few personal words from me and, and my own experience. Uh, I, I came to OSTI straight out of college, uh, and I've been given amazing opportunities to contribute in different ways, to play different roles. Um, I mentioned all these relationships we have had externally. I've uh, had the opportunity to travel all over the world, all over this country, meeting places as we tried to uh, build on our relationships and partnerships. Uh, it's just been a great experience. I've been here uh, for almost half of OSTI's 75 year history, as hard as that is for me to believe. I've had uh, wonderful uh, bosses and leaders over, over that time frame. Uh, I've gotten to work under past uh, OSTI directors, uh, Joe Coyne, Elizabeth Buffum, who mentioned Walt Warnick, and Walt is. Uh, on the call with us today. I'm not sure by Zoom or by live stream, but I think he is with us. And I just want to say thank you to Walt for your service as the OSTI director for many years and, and all that you me meant to OSTI as we went through a period of dramatic change. So thank you to Walt. I also want to uh, single out the, uh, the management team at OSTI here that works with me to manage different parts of the organization. Judy Gilmore, Jeff Given, Carly Robinson, Kelly Dunlap. They each do such a tremendous job in managing their parts of the organization. I'm so proud of them. And I want to say, though, that uh, whether it's me or past OSTI directors or past OSTI managers or so forth, the ultimate success does come down to that individual employee and the team of employees, uh, both current and former. Uh, and I'm, I'm constantly amazed at their talent and their know-how and what they can do, what they can get done, uh, but also their passion, their culture for, for doing a great job, for being customer focused and getting things done in ways that helps both our uh, open science and our classified missions. We have a very meaningful classified mission too. So I wanna thank them as individuals and I really do appreciate all that they've meant to OSTI over those years. So thank you to them. Uh, thank you again to our speakers. Thanks to everyone uh, on the call today. I want to finish by just singling out some individuals who've meant so much putting this program together. Uh, it's, no, it's no mean task to do that, putting, uh, bringing our speakers together, the, the technology behind the live stream, uh, behind setting up the ceremony and so forth. So I want to thank uh, Yvette Wallace, uh, Spencer Castellanovo, Justin Wesley, Joey Fender, uh, Jeff Gibbons technology team. I also want to thank uh, the Office of Science Communications team led by Rick Borchelt and Allison Eckhart uh, and, and, the, and the great folks that you have on your team uh, for, for their parts in putting this program together with us today too. So thank you all. Now I'm going to let you go. Uh, hopefully we'll hang around to, uh, to do this again in 75 years. Uh, but uh, we look forward to seeing all of you again in person. For my OSTI colleagues that are on the call, we're going to have an after party. We're going to go to lunch here in a few minutes, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all there. So thanks again for joining us, and have a good rest of your day. Thanks, everybody.